All right, thank you, everybody, for being here. We're really excited to present on our work related to engaging diverse, academically diverse students in computing and computational thinking. Next slide. Um, so here's essentially what we're hoping to do over the next hour. Um, the first is just kind of give you an overview of what it is that we're doing. And then we're going to really showcase two um, lines of research. Um, there's more, but um, these are the two that we actually currently have data on. <laughs> so, um, so those are, we're going we're to talk about collaborative computing and how to support kids in working together on ill-defined problems related to computing and computational thinking. And then we have a line of research that very specifically looks at engagement and learning of kids who are typically um, disengaged and um, specifically because of um, disabilities that they're facing and the curriculum that may not be accessible to them, so the disabling curriculum. <laughs> And then we're going to talk just very briefly about next steps. Um, the big thing, <laughs> I love this slide, is that this is a huge effort with lots and lots of people. Um, I'm leading the research, but we have, it's so much more enriched because of everybody who is involved. So um, this is just some of the folks, but the, the slide would have gotten um, messier. Oh, go back. But what we have people here is representation across MISTI and College of Ed, or MISTI is part of the College of Education, computer science, um, students, master's students, doctoral students, both um, in computer science, uh, computer engineering, Evan, right? And uh, curriculum and instruction, special education. So you can see that it's a pretty large group of folks who are working together, um, as well as folks in the school districts who are partnering with us. And so we're a, we're a big team. All right, so um, we have two re main reasons that drive our research. Uh, the first is the pipeline um, within um, the STEM careers itself. Computing has so many uh, openings that are coming up that are unfilled. The U.S. <coughs> Department of Labor Statistics has said that in the next five years there are going to be 1.4 million computing jobs. And only um, at this point with the trajectory, we're going to only have 30% of them that are filled. And when we're, they're talking about this, we're not just talking about computer programmers in the traditional sense that we're talking about all fields these days um, are affected by computing. So we're thinking about computational linguistics and we're thinking about the arts. And so um, it's a really wide range of careers that we're hoping to prepare students for. And then the second one is really beyond the STEM pipeline. We're really thinking about um, the benefits of computing on its own, the benefits for practicing real-world application of mathematics, for practicing uh, problem solving, uh, to collaborate together, and then generally there's an equity issue. So when we look at the literature on computing, we're seeing um, that it's, these are isolated experiences for privileged kids. Um, so in after-school activities or enrichment activities, we're also seeing that these opportunities aren't um, necessarily ge geared towards all learners. And so we're thinking, how do we present opportunities that are much more equitable than what we've seen in the past? All right, so this is kind of where we were and where we're going. Um, there's now a growing uh, established rationale for computing, and we've just talked about it very briefly, about why we're interested in computing and computing education. Um, but when we look at the research, um, very few are looking at diverse learners. And diversity, we're thinking very broadly. So, um, you know, gender and socio-cultural backgrounds and disability altogether. And at the time that we started this, there were no studies that looked at kids with disabilities. So, um, I should say at K-12. There are some studies in higher education. And so, University of Washington, for example, has access computer and, and so forth. But um, at K-12, there really wasn't much. Um, and so, well, the research that we're presenting to you is very exploratory. Um, we've come in and you know, the rest of the students will talk about it, but we're taking micro baby steps to try to understand the problem and to try to understand some strategies um, to address the problem. And so that's kind of where we are with all of this. All right, so we have some approaches that we're looking at in terms of both um, studying and coming up with strategies. Uh, the first is that we're very focused on universal design for learning. So the idea of how do we provide 
flexible instructional models that support all learners? How do we represent content in a way that addresses the needs of all learners? How do we allow children to demonstrate their understanding in different ways? Uh, we're looking at different computing platforms. So, for example, um, we're both looking at Code.org and Scratch, and Code.org is a much more linear, progressive way of going through computing, and Scratch is a more open environment. And so we're thinking about how do these different approaches work together rather than saying one is good and one is bad. Um, we're also looking at teaching, modeling, and reinforcing ways of helping kids collaborate together and also balancing letting kids explore and create with explicit instructions so that they're able to really increase their learning and be able to um, innovate in a more strategic way. Here comes Saad. Thank you. All right, so since we are big fans of collaboration, then the first thing that we're going to talk about is the development, validation, and implementation of, an, of a tool that we call the Collaborative Computing Observation Tool. And uh, I'm going to do this along with Quinn and Adam. So the whole thing started with uh, the work of Maya and others that uh, they did two years ago around supporting all learners in school-wide computational thinking. And this was published this year in the Computers and Education. And basically, the purpose of the study was to investigate how elementary school teachers with limited computer science experience in, high, in a high-need school integrated computational thinking into their instruction. So as those guys went to the classroom and they observed the teachers, they also were able to notice some interesting things that are happening in the context of the classroom, as well as what the students were doing when they were engaged in these practices. So I'm going to give you like a, just a little idea about the context of the classroom. So we have the teacher which designed unplugged activities and plugged activities. And basically, the plugged activities were revolving around code.org and Scratch. And uh, what we noticed is the kids were not just left alone to work. They were given kind of collaborative scripts. And the teachers stressed and insisted on the kids to use this script. So basically, it was a kind of collaborative learning context where the students started working alone, each on his or her individual computer. Then whenever they, they felt that they needed help from someone, they were always encouraged to refer to peers and use those scripts that you see over there for, to ask for help. For example, what are you doing? What are you trying to do? What have you tried already? What else do you think you can try? And what would happen if? So given this dynamic nature of the context, we started thinking of interesting questions that are related to the context and to the dynamic nature of the classroom in addition to what the students were doing. So these questions are related to different constructs that are found as well in the literature. For example, how does the student request for help? And who helped the student? How does the student individually problem solve? And how the student or what kind of support did the student receive from the adult and from the peers? And finally, did the computing experience result in skilled concept acquisition or basically like did they really learn computing science concepts or computer science? So to answer these questions, we decided to develop a tool which will help us read the data that we collect, see what's going on in it, what's interesting, what is worth analyzing or further analysis. And we started coming up with a framework that is based on the literature and if our framework revolves, revolved ba basically around collaborative problem solving, which is influenced by other set of variables that are included in the context that I just talked about. For example, like what the teacher or how the teacher behave or receive questions from the students or, for example, direct them to other peers, influence, of course, how the students collaboratively problem solve. We have this idea of uncertainty or ill-defined problems where the students, for example, are stuck and they do not know what to do. And then we have the idea of the group composition, which also plays a role. And here we're referring to the demographics and uh, to the way students interact together, whether they are high achievers, low achievers, low collaborators, high, collaborat high in collaborative learning. And in the collaborative problem solving around computing, we noticed that we have <coughs> levels of adaptive help seeking. Sometimes the student approaches the peer and tells him or her, I need help, and that's it. In other instances, we're seeing that the student is approaching the peer, and he or she is asking for specific help. Like, I need help in the repeat block. What do I place here? What number do I place here? Like, those kinds of good questions that 
require answers from the peer, and whenever we have the answers, the students can proceed problem solving. And we have the idea of the joint problem solving space, how the students are creating this shared space where they work together. We have the outcomes and the products, whether the problem was solved, the problem was not solved. In addition to other things like, for example, when the student says, yay, I did it, shows excitement. Plus, of course, the idea of the socialization when the students are basically off task. I'm going to leave you now with Quinn, who will talk about <laughs> how did this happen. <laughs> I'm going to stand over here. Um, a little bit of a cheat sheet over here. So after we, ob so after we observed um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the classrooms, we kind of came back as the research team and said, okay, so we're seeing this help seeking, we're seeing this, this persistence, we're seeing this collaboration. How can we now systematically bring this together? And so we started with this flow chart, which this partial uh, screenshot of what became quite lengthy. And this, this helped us to serve as a, as, a, as a visual representation of what students are doing when they are having a problem. What, what are students doing um, if a student's helping the peer uh, with, with, a, with a problem? And so trying to kind of capture this in some visual format. Based on this then, we kind of moved this visual format and transferred it to, uh, to, the paper ver to a paper version. And I look at this as kind of like a choose your own adventure, although you're not really choosing the adventure, it's more what the students are actually doing. But Everything uh, starts at node one, okay? All events begin at node one, and I'll, in, in a little bit, I'll, I'm gonna kind of define this, but um, based on where the student goes from here, it kind of dictates where they go in, in, in this process of the collaborative computing observation instrument. So after quite a bit of review and coming back and tweaking, retweaking, tweaking some more, um, we finally got to put this onto an online, um, into our um, online version and uh, Evan's gonna speak a little bit about that. We'll do that online and then I'll talk a little bit. Let's make some Hello, my name is Evan Ramos and I am currently a junior in computer engineering here at the university. I work as a programmer with MISTI, and as part of what I'm doing, I'm helping the research team build this web-based instrument to help them record data. So, in essence, all it is is a simple web page, but it uses JavaScript code in order to dynamically change what's displayed on the web page to create forms like this. You may be familiar with, even maybe 10 years ago on the internet, you could fill out some buttons or check boxes, enter some fields, hit a submit button, and so on. But what I do is that proceed button and others like it on this instrument will trigger some code that will <laughs> see what the researcher has selected and will record that. So as you go through the process of filling out the form following the flowcharts that the research team has created, it will record what they've selected and at the end, there's this bank of data that they can then export for use in a data mining tool or something like that. And we'll show examples in a bit. Um, so this is, this is the sequoia on a, on a page. And uh, the sequoia has 14 nodes. And the nodes describe the possible individual or collaborative behaviors that a student um, that a student can go through. So there's a note about who the student uh, is, uh, initiates, um, what happens when the problem is solved or when the problem is not solved. Now within each of these 14 nodes there are, the, are sub-nodes and these are more detailed to, to the specific uh, nature of that node. So um, with the who is initiated, student initiates the peer, or student initiates an adult, or the student dismisses their attempts to interact. They may have figured out the, the, the problem. As I said, in, 
um, as, as I said before, everything starts at node one. And so if someone, so if someone goes from node one to node three, let's just say then to node nine, that creates a path, right? And each path, so it may, so each path, it either continues to go on until, until it ends, right? Which then becomes an event. So the SQL has 14 nodes with individual subnodes. A path is starting from node one to wherever it ends, and that creates a single event. Um, so now, based on this instrument that, that was developed, how do we measure this, this collaborative computing? Well, first it's important to realize that, um, well, we use the Screencastify uh, software, and this is, um, it, it records the students' computing um, is computing activities as well as their audio, but it doesn't show the picture of the student. So all we're just, all we're seeing is what the student is doing on their computer and their interactions. Um, and so, with the sequoia, it's it's important uh, to know that we are we are looking through the perspective of the student from no one else. So when you're starting at no one, it is always. What is the student doing? And you'll see through, through uh, examples what exactly is um, what I mean by that. Uh, the dependent variables that we can measure, um, we can look at the amount of time that the student is persisting on a particular task. If they're having a, a problem, are they asking for help or are they just struggling through it? Are they giving up? Um, we can look at methods of help seeking. So if they have a problem, are they asking for help? And, and we can also hear the interaction of if someone is helping them, are they, are they using the, um, the framework for asking questions to kind of help them get to the correct answer? Um, we can also uh, hear the interactions between this collaborative interaction of, of how a problem is solved or not solved, as well as any computing challenges they may have. Um, so now we'll show some examples. He's going to set up. So here's this. And then here's this. So while they're setting that up, are there any questions that we can answer in the meantime? Yes. So I just asked Saad, is that right? About the age, so it's one through fifth grade. So help us visualize what's happening in the class. So the, the whole class is sitting at desks and they're allowed to interact with each other, but you randomly pick a child with a disability to focus on or just Yeah, so the way that we're doing this is, and we're, we're focusing not just on K-5, but this particular data is, is that students are, um, we're, the instruments, you're able to look at both collaborative and individual work, but the image is, is that students are working at individual computers, and then um, they're not tethered. So at one point, like, we had headphones on them to reduce noise, and then they never moved around because they were tethered to the computers. And so um, they're and encouraged that's... to get up and to walk to somebody and to, so the classroom is very dynamic. And so, for example, if a student is sitting here and I'm collecting data on, on Melinda, and then Melinda gets up and goes and helps you, that data, um, I'm not going to be able to hear from her end, but then she becomes the peer helper for you, so then I collect that data off of your computer. You so see at the I'm same thinking? time you're gathering data from every child in the classroom on a computer? We're purposefully selecting, at least at this point, because analyzing video data is so time consuming. And so the way, um, for this particular study, uh, we purposefully selected 20 kids, but then we had some audio issues with a few of them. And we looked across demographics, across disability, socioeconomics, and then we had the, the teachers identify um, which students were high collaborators and low collaborators because we wanted to see both models, and also which, teacher, which students, according to them, had high computing skills and low computing skills. Um, I mean, there's some problems with that teacher identified data, but you know, since we're, it's exploratory, um, we're at least looking at it, and then, for example, if a teacher says this is a high collaborator, we may see different evidence. Like, is that a child who has a lot of um, learned helplessness, so they're constantly going to somebody to try to solve the problem for them? And so that's the kind of data that we're analyzing now. So our purposeful selection, I think, is going to get more targeted as we move on. But for now, that seemed to be a good strategy. 
Kathleen has a I have a question. And for this study, the teacher is a high competency. Uh, that's a great question. question. So here's what our knowledge about that, and Melinda can talk about this for her study, uh, for our study, but is that um, computing pedagogy is emerging, right? Mm -hmm. At least in K-12. It's an emerging pedagogy. So um, no teacher, when George and I went out and did interviews with teachers who we thought were very competent, nobody felt like they were competent. Even the ones who took like online classes on Scratch. I mean, everybody feels like because the pedagogy is still emerging, they don't know what they're doing. So that's the answer. Right. Okay. No. The answer to that is no. <laughs> they, they were part of the study. Yes. Yeah. There's lots to say. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, so now we have uh, four video clips, which are on the yellow sheet of paper. And it kind of has timestamps and a transcription <laughs> of what was said. Uh, the first one that we'll look at will be the clip at 625 where the student seeks attention from the adult. Uh, it's socialization and it's around a non-computing topic. Uh, this will be an elementary school student, uh, a male student uh, who was identified by his teacher as a, a low collaborator and a low computer. And the student does not have an IEP and does not receive free or reduced lunch. And you can Mr. click on it and tell it how many times you, you know want to repeat the baby block. So tell it how many steps you want to take forward. Now one more Seconds. thing is you can put as many commands as you want inside the repeat block. There's so a baby in this example, born every you're telling it to move forward and turn left, which it'll do five yeah. times. All right, good job and have fun. Yeah. Or, uh, I think it's, it might actually be every single minute. Okay, so as you can tell, we have some fun while coding as well, but uh, that, that would be something, like I mentioned, the student is seeking attention completely unrelated from the uh, computing activity that he's a part of, uh, and he's getting that attention from the adult. Next, we will go to uh, the clip at 9.30, uh, where it's just showing the student working independently on his, uh, on his computer, and there's going to be a little self-talk as well. <laughs> All right, and so right there, he's just uh, working on the code. Uh, he runs it, Does, doesn't get what he's going for. So he says, dang it, um, stop making a giant triangle. It so it's, a, it's just self-talk. And if we would show you the minute and a half before, minute and a half after, you know, he's just continuing to work throughout this self-talk. Uh, and then we're going to go now to the third clip, uh, the clip at 1343. He's going to seek attention. It's going to be from uh, his peer. Uh, and then you'll see a little bit of the, um, the framework, the collaboration framework that we talked, or that Saad talked about earlier. Uh, and then we'll see the problem not being solved. I guess you're just Can you supposed to put them me? together. Collaborate. Okay, what are you trying to do? I'm trying to do this. It's not working. I just think I'm trying to try already. I tried that. Okay. Um, what else do you think you can try? Oh no, what would happen if I um, um, <laughs> Okay, so in that video, he uh, asked for help from his peer. The peer comes over and goes through the framework. So, you know, what have you tried already? What else do you think you could try? But there's no deep interaction of him stating what he's tried or that, 
you know, he's turned right by 60 degrees or, you know, it's just, uh, um, and then uh, as you can, or as you kind of heard, she said, what would happen if, and then we, you couldn't really tell what she said, but she said, you know, you could move straight or move, you know, right by this many degrees, but they don't, don't really know. They're trying to collaborate, but it's more of a surface level collaboration that's occurring. Um, and then we'll go to our final clip, which is at 1827. It's student seeks attention. And we kind of pick this up midway through uh, of a longer interaction. So what happens before you see this clip is that he again was asking for help from a peer. And the peer does not know what to do. So as we pick it up, the peer will then be asking another student in the room if he knows how to help this student. So more of a collaborative effort. Do you remember how to do this? Do you remember how to do this? Oh no. Actually, yes, I do. Mom, I cannot tell you the answer. I'll have to do it the hard way. Okay. Oh, wait, that's right. Okay. We're trying to do, yeah, we're trying to do that. We're trying to do that. Okay, yeah. What else do you think you can try? Yeah, I know, we try. What would happen if. Um, you, you erased all of it. Yeah. Well, so, because those quads are mixed up, maybe. Except you can't erase that, darn it. And you can't erase it anyway. Okay. You can keep that. Maybe you should put that there. Or do you want to keep on repeating it? Great. Okay. What would happen if... I have Amber with this one. Okay. What would happen if... Do you know how to do the triangle? Yeah, I do that. What would happen if you put it... Put the triangle scripts right here. Come if you need help again. There. I did the triangle. All right, so we'll stop it right there. But um, as you see, the other student comes over. Uh, you know, kind of says, no, I don't know how to do it. Yes, yes, I actually do. I have to do it the hard way, which uh, to them the hard way would be using the collaboration. Uh, so, as, <laughs> so, so instead of just telling the student the answer, and as you can see, he just ran right through the collaboration framework where he says, what are you trying to do? Yeah, he didn't even let the student respond. He's just saying, yeah, okay, yeah, I already know that. Okay, just make sure he checked the boxes of what the teacher would have liked for him to do. Um, but then you do see later on, there's a little more in-depth of a collaborative effort where he's, you know, he's asking about, do you know how to make the triangle? Okay, yes you do. Okay, how about we put that here? Okay, let's go ahead uh, and run it to see what we need to do next. Okay, you probably need to put a repeat block. So there's a much more in-depth effort after the initial um, surface level running through of the collaborative framework. Uh, at the time, oh sorry, were almost insisting on people giving them the answer. And so having a strategy so that, I mean, A, from a management perspective, so that the teacher isn't always being asked what to do. I mean, that was kind of the initial go ask a friend because th there's only one teacher in the classroom sometimes too. Um, and the other is that, you know, to break that cycle of learned helplessness so that students can work together and that a student who's struggling actually can work through a problem and hopefully at the end of it get to some kind of resolution and see that there's a process to go through from having a problem to uh, working through that. So we, so we seeked out um, experts from different um, 
disciplines to kind of for, for the validity of this instrument. And right now we're working on the reliability. And as you can see, there's a lot of extraneous noise, which um, does, make it a, does make it a little difficult for knowing exactly who's talking, because th they all seem to sometimes sound alike. There's Any headphones to help with that. True. It's yes. a lot easier to hear with your headphones. Uh, but with with, uh, with reliability, we kind of have a two phase. It's a it's, it's a two phase process. The first phase is is we need a hundred percent reliability in that we are seeing an an event occur where it starts from one of these um, sub notes. So if we can agree that at ten seconds we notice that the stu that that the student is initiated by the peer, that's the first part. And then we're working on kind of this uh, this second phase and making sure that we're reliable in the remaining paths, remaining nodes. Yeah, so, so phase one is, are we seeing the same thing, the beginning of an event together? Um, and once we reach 100% there, phase two is, do we see the same sub nodes in the same order? So we've got, like, we have to have, you know, virtually 100% for phase one. And then for phase two, we're hoping to get at least 80% reliability to, to feel accurate. Okay. So, so I'm going to now try to demonstrate the power of the Sequoia and why it's a very interesting, lovely, impressive tool. Um, so basically, if we, we see here that the, we have the nodes that um, Quinn talked about. And we have this example of the student where he, let's say, um, practiced or experienced four different events. Okay? The, what the first one was seeking attention from an adult works independently, seeks attention from a peer, and seeks attention from another peer another time. So as a coder, when I see the clip that you just saw, what I can do is I can go to the online sequoi, and let's say, let's pick up the student seeks attention, the third clip. So we notice that the student seeked attention from the, from the, from the peer. Uh, the peer just talked about the framework. He started using the framework. They were involved in a collaborative talk. Then at the end, the problem was not solved. So I go to the online sequoi, and I go as, the, students, uh, the student seeks attention, and I go to two. It's going to tell me that I'm going to choose that the student expressed the problem, and the problem is related to computing, so they are on task. Then I'm going to go as the student expresses need for help, but not explicit to the problem, because he, wa he wasn't like clear what he needs help on. Then we move into that the student is initiating the peer, and then we go as the peer and the student are interacting together. Then we go into the peer and the student collaboratively discuss the problem, and the problem was not solved. And finally, we go to here where we say that the problem was not solved and the student works independently. So this is kind of like a path that started with the first <coughs> node and ended with node 14. Now, suppose that I'm going to do the same thing for this student for these four different paths. And then I can have a click, and thanks to Evan, where I can <coughs> see this in this form, mm -hmm. which we call the directed graph. One is called the detailed directed graph, and one is called the weighted directed graph. And as I mentioned in the beginning, the whole purpose of the tool is to tell me, as a researcher, what is interesting, what's going on with this student. So for example, if we look at these graphs, these kind of the same thing for the same token. So different faces for same token. So we have here. We start, so this student um, participated in five or six different events or took six different paths that started with one, two, three, four, and these are the nodes. And we come here, we see that the weight of the line can tell me what was the student favorite path or most chosen path. So we can know if the student like, is seeking help from the peer all the time or the teacher all the time. Was the, student, was the student able to solve all the problems in this collected data events or not all the problems and stuff like this. As for example, for me, we are now interested in analyzing the data from the perspective of being able to evaluate whether the students are really collaborating or not, whether they're using the collaborative framework as a cue card or just as a good script where they are really learning computer science with that. Also, what we can do is we can take all the students, all the students that we analyze using the sequoia and ask the sequoia to generate a graph for all the students. So all the data that we collected, we know what was the most common path. And then as researchers, we can go and dig more into the thick lines and try to understand what's going on, why it's going this way, what are the students learning, not learning, and all these nice questions. Yeah, what's nice there is that we can also make comparisons look at kids who have access to technology at home versus not, or kids, well, 
with disabilities versus not, or boys versus girls, we can, not that we're going to oversimplify and generalize too much, but a lot, in aggregating the data, so looking at it both disaggregated and aggregated makes a lot of sense. <coughs> So major what were the, our major findings and tips so far in terms of the collaborative nature of the context? So when working independently, and we have students work independently in C4, so when, they wor when working independently, some students, they spend a lot of time on a single level, trying, and here it's re related to code.org, basically, where we have a set of levels, and each time the students need to code to pass the level. So they are stuck on a single level, they show persistence, but do not collaborate and do not successfully complete the level. That's one thing that we're seeing. Another thing that we're seeing, most common collaborative events, so when the students decide to collaborate, they ended up with problems not being solved. So some students are not effectively using the collaborative script to solve the problem, just as the example that was shown by Adam. So the student will give, what, what have you tried already? I tried this and that, and things like that. We have students are not watching the video hints, so the code.org is designed in a way that every time the student like, is using all the blocks, there is a video that pops up and say, you are using all the blocks, but try to figure out a different configuration for the blocks, or stuff like this. So we see the students directly clicking like X. We don't need to see this video. And then at C, we have the students' lack of understanding of computer science concepts that are associated with the problem. And that's critical here, because that, for example, explains why in the last example, the peer that came to help the student probably had the better knowledge on the computer science concepts as well, and was able to use this understanding in asking questions or using this collaborative script. And finally, we have uh, lots of competition, especially in code.org as compared to Scratch. So in the case of Scratch, we have more openness to creativity and students are talking like they talk, uh, they use uh, other terms that are used in code.org. It's not kind of like programming or soft or, or coding oriented. It's kind of sometimes include questions about what background do I use? What sprite do I create and things like that. Can you say more about how the competition manifests itself with the code.org? We're seeing a lot of, what level are you on? Oh, I'm on level 12. Oh, okay. I'm on level okay, 13. Gotcha. And you know, part of what we want kids to do is also stop and reflect and think and not just level up. And so the um, extrinsic motivator of leveling up is making kids not stop and learn because they just want to move up a level because that's kind of the gamification piece. And, I mean, there are advantages to gamifying coding, but that's one of the disadvantages that we've seen. All right. Okay, so we're gonna shift gears a little bit here now. Um, so I came onto this project last spring, and I don't know anything about coding or computer science or computational thinking in schools. My background is this, I was a special education teacher for a long time, and I worked with kids that had multiple disabilities. And Maya asked me to go into these classrooms that were doing computing and do some case studies of some of the students that had disabilities and the teachers were saying, these kids are not participating in computing. They don't understand, they aren't, they aren't being successful. And so I joined in to the things that this whole group has been doing and we, and we picked two students purposefully uh, two different teachers, nominated students that had disabilities, identified disabilities, were receiving special education services, and were not being successful at all in computing in the classroom. And so I went in and did observations for a semester, uh, looking at watching these two students. I interviewed their teachers, their general education teacher who was doing the computer instruction, their special education teachers who were supporting, making sure all of the supports they needed were in place, and one of the students also had a one-on-one -on -one paraprofessional that went with him throughout the school day. And so for that student, we also interviewed the paraprofessional. And what we, what we were thinking going into this is that there, there's got to be something about computational thinking and about teaching kids to do computational thinking that requires some additional support if you have a disability. There's, there's something that we need to be doing inside of, of teaching computational thinking to help kids with disabilities access this content. And um, so Maya kind of tasked me with, let's do these case studies and see if we can find what those things are. What are some things we need to be incorporating into CT pedagogy to allow kids with disabilities to fully participate? So that's what we were looking for. 
And we um, did all this observation in these interviews, and we used explanation building, um, which is a four-step process of just coming up with a theoretical explanation for the kid's experience, then looking at all your data and seeing, is that a justifiable explanation? No? Okay. Edit. New explanation. Go back to your data. Does that explanation hold up? No? Okay. You get the point, right? So we, we took all of this data and we tried to explain why are these kids having a hard time? Why, what supports are missing for them? And, um, yeah, can you go ahead and go forward? So the two students we worked with, are, we call them Horatio and Deacon. One was in fourth grade and one was in fifth. Horatio had autism and intellectual disability. He had more significant support needs than Deacon. He was verbal, he did speak, but he did not speak to people often, and he did a lot of um, echoing what people said to him. And um, he's the one that had the one-on-one -on -one adult support. Deacon had fetal alcohol syndrome that had caused a learning disability for him, and he mostly struggled with paying attention and being on task and completing his work. So both of these kids love being on the computer. Yes. Right. Computers were motivating to them. So we've already got some buy-in, at least on that end. So what we started with, our, our theory here, was that students with disabilities who are disengaged during com computational thinking require CT-specific supports to successfully engage in CT activities. And when those supports are not available, when they're missing, they cannot meaningfully engage. So we were thinking about things like accessibility features on a computer. Can we turn on some accessibility feature that's going to help this kid navigate? Can we provide the kid with visual um, instructions for how to use code.org instead of just having them depend on text from the website, right? Those were the kinds of things we were thinking we were going to need to do. And the teachers agreed with us. That's what they were hoping we would bring to the table too, is some ideas of what they could be doing to support their kids. So I went to Horatio's class and I watched him every day. And on the, the, your left, uh, is what we saw when we went to watch him. So what was happening is he had this paraprofessional whose job was to help him learn to code. So she's sitting right next to him, and she is 60 years old. She told me in her interview, she told me, my husband has this thing called Word, and if I need to type a letter, he helps me, he like gets that open for me, and then I, I think he prints it or something. She didn't... She did not have computer skills. So what would happen is Horatio would go get his computer, he'd open it, he'd log in, he'd get on code.org, he could do all of that on his own. And then the first puzzle would come up and the, the paraprofessional would be like, oh golly. She'd take the computer and she'd start talking about what she was gonna try. And she'd be trying all these different things and Horatio would be sitting there, sometimes watching her and sometimes not. Until she got something built, you saw the blocks, she'd build some set of blocks, she'd hand the computer back to him and say, okay, click. And he'd click, and it'd run, and it wouldn't work, and she'd take the computer back. So the dark red is the amount of time that he didn't even have access to his computer. He was just listening to her explain what she was trying. Um, and he, but, uh, no, I'm sorry, he, he, had, he didn't have access to his computer and he, wasn't, he didn't seem to be paying attention to her. He was just kind of hanging out. The lighter red is when he didn't have his computer, but he seemed to be paying attention to what she was doing. She was watch, he was watching her, the screen, he was paying attention. And the green are the times that he had his computer in front of him. So we got to thinking, wait a minute, uh, the problem here doesn't seem to be the supports he needs. He just doesn't even have his computer. Um, maybe we should see if we can figure that out. So they, the paraprofessional's like, here, yes, please try it. And she gave me a chance to help. And I was like, all right, all I'm going to do is I'm going to keep the computer in front of him. And I'm going to do the same thing she's doing. I'm going to talk to him about things to try. And what happened was when we gave him access to the computer and some verbal models, the kid finished three levels independently on code.org in 20 minutes, which kind of blew everybody away. Everyone thought this kid didn't understand coding at all, when in fact, the supports that he was receiving just weren't the supports he needed. 
So and because he's not, he's fairly nonverbal. Yeah. It was, and you had a staff with him who didn't understand computing, kind of that combination of things. And she knew him very well because she'd been with him for like three years. Mm -hmm. So even she was really surprised at what he was able to do. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, no. That's great. Okay. So um, here are some quotes from what they said before the before the. Um, oh yeah, we'll skip this. Okay, <laughs> so moving on. This is the other kid. The quotes are great. We'll let you read them later. So the other student, um, Deacon, he uh, had access to his computer all the time. He didn't. Ha the teacher thought he he knows how to code. He just never actually codes. And um, the red bars here are the amount of time he wasn't on task. He was on Minecraft because he loved it. And he was really good at flipping back and forth from tab to tab when the teacher happened to be behind him. <laughs> so this was obviously the first two days that I observed him. He was not spending time doing what he was supposed to be doing, which was consistent with what was happening for him across subject areas. On the third day that I was observing, the teacher made a deal with him. She went over to him. She said, hey, what level are you on in code? He told her. She said, oh, we're at about the same place. I'll race you. I'll race you for, I can't remember what she offered him, candy bar or something. And he said, I want a milkshake. And she said, all right, I'll race you. I'll give you a milkshake. Whoever wins buys the other a milkshake. <laughs> and look what happens. He was on task almost all the time, four weeks after that, trying to beat his teacher. What's interesting about this is that this is a, the type of support that Deacon was receiving in reading in math, in social studies. They had set up incentives for him to get his work done and consequences for when he didn't. He'd have to stay after school if he didn't get his work done in reading. He'd have to, uh, he, could, he could earn points towards certain rewards if he got his work done. And so all this teacher did was take these supports that were working for him in other situations and apply it to CT. And so that's kind of where we ended up w w with this initial hypothesis that there was something about computational thinking that required something unique for teachers to do to have kids be successful. Our thinking totally shifted on that. And we realized, you know what? Actually, what we already understand about disability is that each of us, regardless of, of the cause of our disability, have some support needs, whether it's I need glasses or I'm not going to be able to read this page, or I need pretty pervasive supports to understand concepts. That's what disability services is all about, identifying what supports you need and to, to succeed in a certain situation and then providing those supports. And what we think is at least as a starting point with computational thinking for kids with disabilities, we need to look at the supports that they need in other contexts, in other subject areas, and translate those into CT first and start there. And if those supports are sufficient and they're successful in CT, then pedagogy is already in good shape at that point, right? And if they're not, then we can start to look at what are the other things that we need to be doing at a pedagogical level to ensure all people have access to computational thinking. So um, we've kind of put that into a cyclical framework for people to use as they start thinking about how do we create universally designed pedagogy um, so that computational thinking is truly a subject area for everyone. So I'm going to turn it over to Moon real quick. She's going to talk to you about next steps for all of this. So I'm kind of second Melinda. Um, so like taking out the cross case assertion from the previous case study. Um, I'm just going to read this. If a student is struggling in CT, then first ensure that their student specific supports are in place during CT instruction and activities. If a student continues to struggle, then explore additional CT specific support to incorporate into, into the pedagogy. So at first, I'm going to observe um, how they're doing and looking at their engagement. And based on their engagement, um, I'm going to compare the engagement from CT activities to other content and see the difference between those two. So based on their difference, um, there will be like two directions. So first, if the CT is CT engagement is lower than the other content engagement, then we will try to generalize student-specific support into the CT activities. And if 
The opposite side, we should find the student's specific support first. After that, I'm going to observe again their engagement, and then if the engagement increase, the problem is solved, and engagement is not increased, then we should look at the CT specific support. All right, so I'm going to wrap it up really quick. Um, as you, I am just listening to all of our students. They're so brilliant. I'm so proud of them. I know, right? <laughs> I, just, I know. I just, I feel just so privileged that you know George and I get to work with these incredible students, um, and I. This was just awesome. Um, so um, next, we've got so many things going on, but um, generally the next steps are Moon Explain, um, one of the trajectories that we're doing. And essentially that's kind of our model, is we're doing these very small exploratory studies and we're like sort of getting a window into what we're seeing and then we're like honing our research questions more and more that way. Um, we have a STEM plus C grant that just got funded. Bob Sakes on it, we're really excited about that. That's starting in January, and so we're just kind of getting our ducks in a row on that particular project. And we're looking at integrating math and CT together and learning, creating some learning trajectories of how do we um, do integrated computing within mathematics. Um, yeah, we just mentioned the study that Moon's going to help with. We're continuing to look at collaborative computing. And uh, one of Saad's project that's coming up is that we're looking at integrating computing into scientific argumentation, collaborative scientific argumentation as well at the middle school level and using the instruments that we've already developed there. So I know it's, it's one, but we'd love to take questions and, sorry. Can I just add one thing? I, the school itself is really on board with this and so is the district. Mm -hmm. And they really, I think, are appreciative of this and, and the school wants to, wanted a presentation on the research to know what, you know, what lessons could be learned. So while maybe not specifically action research, these questions and, and this research is um, really applicable, yeah. you know, almost immediately applicable to what teachers are asking about. So yeah, that's a really, really good point. Exciting. So a lot of these research questions are coming directly from the schools, which we feel really good about, so that then afterwards we're able to present the data to the uh, folks that we're working with, and a lot of our new research questions are generated from kind of that cyclical research to practice process so that um, the teachers are able to recognize the research questions as those that they've also come up with as well, so they're co-constructed. Other questions? I know I want to be mindful of everybody's time. Okay. So good. The pure activity is as interesting to me as the main learner activity. Are you including some study of that in this work? Of the peers? Right, how they, how they do assistance. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, do you want to? Um, so the way that we're looking at the peers, um, this actually came out of um, what we were, we were observing the peers. And so what we saw them do uh, were several things. One of the things we saw almost initially is that they were grabbing the mouse and they were doing the work for the other person. And so a lot of this work came out of the fact that we saw, um, here, I, I don't know how to help you but I know how to do it, and I can't really vo verbalize it. And so talking about computing is not an easy thing anyway. Um, but so we saw them taking the mouse. We saw, um, like, I'm just going to give you the steps from one to the bottom, and now you go do it. So we, we, a lot of those things are things that we can capture on the sequoia as well. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at, yeah. I was going to say, the teachers, that collaborative framework the kids were kind of going through uh, in a routinized way, at least in what we saw there, was something that teachers came up with, that um, two of the teachers, uh, uh, to, to really address these problems, uh, or to, to try to make more effective that collaborative effort. And so the kids were uh, uh, trained, encouraged to, to do these things and to avoid you know, taking them out. I was thinking similar to Bob. I, I would be interested in like conditional probabilities. If 
if the kid asks these three questions and gets a response to each, what's the likelihood that X will happen versus if the kid, for example, asks all three questions, doesn't wait for a response, what's more likely to happen? Or if the oh, kid shows you something, what's the conditional probability of this versus this? So I think your data are so rich in the possibilities of what you could look at and consider. Maybe from those uh, directed graphs that you have, you could build some of these conditional yeah. probabilities. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Okay. That's good. Yeah. I have some other comment. I was wondering. Uh, I, in learning math and also in learning computational thinking, one, one of the biggest things is to be able to stand outside of yourself and ask, you know, and imagine what would I be telling myself what I'm doing? You know, could I tell what I'm doing to somebody else? And that has been the hardest thing for a lot of kids, you know, instead of saying, I do it, uh, tell somebody else what you're doing. And I was just wondering, I mean, you have access now to a lot of such data, mm -hmm. because you can actually observe that, and you, <coughs> there's a way for you to <coughs> annotate that. I was wondering how much of this <coughs> would be transferable to the learning of math and to sciences and, and to all the other subject matters. And could that be an area of uh, <laughs> further research? You know, because that, that would be a wonderful thing. The, the key of problem solving is to abstract out all of these things. Here's the big problem that, that I was we were meeting with the district this morning, and they're they're wanting to do more of computational thinking, more of the computer science. And um, everybody acknowledges how important it is, almost as a core subject. Um, when they put Courses into the high school, the associate superintendent was saying, we don't have to sell it. The kids will sign up. We the kids will sign up. But here's the problem. There's no space. The curriculum is full. Mm -hmm. So the only solution, you know, nothing's going to, it's not like we're going to say, well, well, instead of math, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of instead BAM, of right? Instead of foreign language. Well, <laughs> then, then the horrible, this, yeah. then the horrible stuff like that. Instead of art, you know, we're going to, mm -hmm. you have this elective. So the only way that we're going to figure this out is to, to be, and, but nobody knows how to do it. Nobody, um, uh, the, this school's, I think, on the edge of, in this district, and trying to figure that out. I think, if I remember correctly, we've had teachers observe that the students are starting to use the collaborative framework in other subjects. Yes. And so oh, that's that's def we're, we're definitely looking at expanding our research. When they were the one, the case study about that, I was thinking, well, I wonder if these kids are nicer to their siblings at home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be interesting to hear, do parents ever say anything like, oh, he doesn't just grab it and do it for his brother or sister, he's actually helping him now, or trying to help him but figure it out. I have a wonderful picture. Uh, uh, some of the students were doing a workshop for um, the neighbor district, Burbank, and, and uh, uh, my mentor, Ken Travers, was there to see, and he started working on it, and one of the students who'd been using this collaborative framework came over, and it's so interesting to see her there, standing beside him as he's trying to work, and she doesn't take his mouth, you know, she's, she's going through the training, but, you know, the U.S. director of the Second International Math Study as he's learning to code in Scratch. It was, yeah, it was uh, so I'm just wondering, so I know when a student like stands up in their computer to go help someone else, they we kind of lose them in the data from being the student to being a peer. Is there a way to track a singular student to see if they become a peer and are able to lead someone through if that influences how well they can, like how quickly they can level up because they've done explained the concept? Is there a way to kind of track that or do you know that? Um, at this point, the answer to that is no. I mean, if we look, there are a lot of complications around this kind of data. I'd love that. Like, I have all these ideas about how we can move forward with the instrument. Remember, we're like, we're <laughs> ground level. Um, because I think you're right. I think that there's a lot to that and we're seeing like, how is one child, if I know, mm -hmm this is the code for this one kid. How do they behave when they're the peer versus the person getting? And then also what happens in these, uh, it, it also looks different, um, not in co like in a scratch environment where they're co-constructing something together and how do they, how does collaboration look differently than in that particular situation too? Um, so yeah, that's, that's gonna happen eventually, I hope, but, because I agree. 
Have you already done some uh, experiments with scratch environment? Yeah. Stayed on the code at all? So last spring, um, we, we had the first pilot where we did the integrated math and mm -hmm. um, CT. And so we have data from that. So we can see some very different kinds of interactions. Yeah, because um, I was thinking the, you know, the metaphors that used in Scratch and all that would actually encourage kids to, to talk about everyday things, you know? The background with this and that and so on. And the rich the character set they have. Yeah, and so Sat's pilot. Facilitate a collaboration. Yeah, Sat, so I don't know for a second if you want to talk so yeah, about your pilot. Yeah, next step. Like, uh, we have a pilot study that's going to start um, in next this November where we designed like an activity that is scratch based and it needs, it requires the students to have an understanding of some science concepts related to energy and sustainability. And they will work in scratch and we're gonna use the instrument to collect data and, and analyze data. November. This will be the stuff that I'll look forward to that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was just talking to Todd yesterday because Todd came by yesterday uh, uh -huh. and did some of this. I was just talking to him about that yesterday. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah you, I came by, talked to them, and I was Very just good. talking about integrating them into sciences and everything. So this what you just said, yeah. The curriculum writing is taking place. The the curriculum writing is taking place on campus. So. Um, when you talk about computer science, for me, I think of you when you're talking in a language, like you're just you're talking in Scratch, or I forget what the one is they use on code.org. But um, I, I always, the kids, the first thing I would say to the kids is, read me your code. And so uh, none of that's going on here. I mean, the kids don't seem to have any sense of what those, what their code is doing. Code so, yeah. you know, read me your code. And that's how I start every conversation. When they come over and say, I don't know what I'm doing, I say, well, read me your code. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is any of that going on? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Oh, that's, that's, that's interesting, actually. And what I believe, this is personal, and I, I don't know. Uh, um, I believe that those types of activities, the code.org, provide a very good context if you want to teach your kids explicitly about computer science concepts, like iteration, sequence, all these like very computer science-based concepts. Mm -hmm. However, if you want the kids like to express themselves more and talk probably about their goals, then I think integration here is the key. You can't do it without having the kids really understand, for example, some science concepts, and they implement these in building a certain code or math concepts and doing this. Right, because, I mean, code. fourth and fifth grade, they should understand the concept of a triangle. And if they can't look at their code and see that what they're turning it, they're asking it to turn, and how many times are they asking? Right. So, I mean, they're not going to... They're not going to go any further if they can't read their yeah. code and say, well, here it's going forward, and then I ask it to turn three times, so it should be making me a triangle, and it's not. Mm -hmm. no. you, know, you know, one of the, the, I think, along with this integration problem, there's the school, I think of this kind of school versus Papert, <laughs> you know? I mean, uh, that, that is the Seymour Papert vision of discovery, of engagement, of, of uh, interesting ideas, of powerful, Tools, the computer being able to facilitate learning in creative ways, and then school, and code.org is kind of school-like, and it's like, here's the instruction, here's the next level, here's the next thing, you know, it, it and, and so it deprives you, it, you, you can language. almost doing it, you can do it without, you do it without owning it, you don't, mm -hmm. you don't really get ownership of the code.org, you just move to the next, so you the don't, next you, level. You can't yeah, you're, you're doing somebody else's thing. You know, it's not your it's not your you tool it. you're creating. Yeah. And, and Scratch is based on that the, theatrical metaphor. You're making the scene. You're writing the script. You're drawing the background. You're, you know, putting the the characters on the on the uh, uh, stage. So. But going back to the math, uh, you know, if a student was doing a word problem and they wrote me an equation, I would say to them, "Read me your equation." And they would say it's two fifty for each uh, burger and a dollar fifty for each drink, and I've got eight dollars to spend. So that's how they had to read me their math, and I think that's the same way they need to read you their coding. Yeah, I think that we'll look at it. I think that's a really good point. Because it could go on the collaboration yeah. page. It could. It could totally do that. Thank speak you. to me. <laughs> yeah. Step number one. Speak to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I I think if they can really do that, they can they can read the math to you or they can read the code to you. That's the next higher level of understanding. Yes. Yeah. And that has to do, you know, sometimes they can do it for you, but I don't know how to tell you how to do it. 
Yeah. And that precisely is uh, what you just asked. You know, yeah. uh, read me the code so that you know you can do it on your own. Because what you're saying, they can only do it. Uh, but haven't been able to do and they're not really strategic about it. <laughs> 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 this would be meta learning. Yeah. 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 So what we're saying is that they're going to mess with the code, and mm -hmm. then it doesn't work, and then they're going to mess some more, okay. and it's not going to work, and they're going to mess, and they're not really being very strategic, right? In terms right. of this is why, yeah. like, why am I only going to look at one variable at a time? And this is where that balance, so that we don't like. We don't take the creativity out, but we provide some kind of structure for students so that they're able to to iterate more effectively and efficiently. So we've got a long way to go, I guess. But there are lots of activities in Unplug. Yeah. And in the mathematics, we love the Unplug. It's actually reading your yep. programming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're very, very good. And it seems to be. It seems to be encapsulated in step one. Wasn't that tell me what you've done? Yeah. Like. But it's not very articulated. Right. So I Clearer. think what Kathleen was saying, the tell, me, that, tell me all the steps. Yeah. Read yeah. your code. Yeah. I think that, that that's the part in that step one that that could really be powerful. Yeah. I just want to say uh, that um, as students, and then, we are so appreciative of being able to work with Maya and George, and we yes. learn yes. so yes. much. And um, we thank you for this opportunity. Yeah. We really I think we are. Well, I would say I think you're in good hands. <laughs> <laughs> yes. good. Thank well, you. thank you, everybody. I know we're past 1 o'clock, right? So. Yeah, we got a little